All right, here we go. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Rob Lauer. I'm a developer advocate at Telerik, where I deal with products such as Kendo UI Mobile and Icinium. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today. Um, I get to talk about App Store rejection, which is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, it's a little bit of a dubious honor to have been invited here because clearly only somebody who's been rejected as many times as I would be remotely qualified to talk to you guys about this. But um, So we're talking about App Store rejection here. Um, my talk's going to focus mostly on the iOS App Store um, because if any of you have submitted these in the past, uh, you know that um, iOS can be much more difficult than Android um, and the other stores to get an app approved. Um, they have much more, uh, many more guidelines to follow. They have a manual review process. Um, and this is what we're trying to avoid, right? Oh, can't really see it at all. But uh, this is the uh, resolution center from Apple. This is uh, the purgatory of App Store rejection. Um, if you ever get an app denied initially, this is where you're going to be sent, and this is where you will have to go and deal with the App Store reviewers who are real people with real feelings. Um, so uh, it's important to remember that when you get really upset when you, uh, like me, when you get rejected and you want to lash out at somebody or something. Um, so the truth is, we all know that um, it can be difficult to get an app approved, especially on the iOS App Store. Um, like I said before, uh, the process can be difficult on the iOS side. It can be a week or two once you first submit before you actually um, get a result back, which you need to include in your, you know, in your development cycle. Um, on, the, on the Google side, it's, it can be a matter of hours. I think the last time I submitted an app to Google, it was like two hours before it was on the App Store. It was pretty amazing. Um, but Apple's a whole different beast. So, um, so why is this the case? Well, in this slide I shamelessly stole from Reddit. Um, I'm going to propose that maybe uh, Apple's uh, guidelines are a little verbose, a little too wordy. Um, if you, if this, is not a, this is not a book that you sit down and read by the, by the fireplace at night. Um, this is something that I have scanned. I've, um, sometimes I've taken this book and I'm like, all right, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to actually read. And you get through like, a couple pages of each chapter and it's like, ah, I, I just can't deal with this anymore. Um, Oops, I'm already getting into my tips. So what I'm going to talk about today, and I, I, I knew I had a couple different ways to approach this. What I decided to do was sort of take the machine gun scattershot approach where I am going to throw a ton of tips at you that I've personally learned and some that I've read about online and heard through other people. Um, things you can avoid, things you should do um, to avoid rejection, and mostly concentrating on the iOS side, but actually a lot of what I'm talking about really applies to hybrid mobile app development in general. So um, let's just dig in. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and not go too quickly. Uh, I'll tell you right now that, um, if, that I will post uh, my slide deck online if you ever need to run through these tips, because there are a lot, I, I, I grant you. Um, and a lot of these, a lot of them are sort of functional in nature. Um, I, I only get technical on a few of these. So a lot of these things you can think about as you're designing uh, sort of the concept of your app before we really get into the nuts and bolts. All right, I'm starting out with a huge one here. Uh, you need to make your app relevant and useful to a relatively broad population. Uh, this is surprisingly important if you think about it, because a lot of you are going to come, you're going to have a client come to you and say, well, could you build me an app that's just going to be used by my company's um, employees, for example? Or maybe you have a, a basketball league, a local basketball league, and the app is just going to be used for their scheduling purposes. Well, Apple is not going to allow that app to be in their app store because it does not apply to a broad population, right? It's a very small segment of the population. Um, just an important thing to remember. Um, you can get around this, of course, by using, um, if you're familiar with it, uh, ad hoc um, distribution or even a, an enterprise app store. It's kind of out of the scope of the conversation here, but there are ways to get around this. But if you want it to be in the public app store, it's got to apply to a broad population. Okay, don't abuse the file system. Um, so since I think it was iOS 5.1, Apple does not allow apps to save data to the device without the user's permission. Um, and if you're really lazy like me and you don't want to like figure out how to do that and you just want to cheat, um, you, can, you can save data to the device's cache. Um, and maybe even that doesn't mean anything to you, but really the simplest way to, to solve this 
uh, is to simply use HTML5 local storage, which is about the easiest thing in the world to do, um, just saving key value pairs. Um, another option is Brian LaRoe's um, awesome little JavaScript library, Lawn Chair, which has been used by many, many people here, I'm sure, um, which also, I'm sure, uses local storage in there, but it's even a simpler way, provides more functionality to access local storage and other storage mechanisms. All right, so go easy on downloading data. What I mean by this is that a lot of your users, even today, are still on really limited data plans, right? Um, like me, I even have a, a 200 meg limit to my data plan every month. So if I find out an app's downloading, say, you know, 10, 15, 20 megabytes a day, it's going to destroy my data plan in no time at all. So I don't believe there are any specific guidelines from Apple on this, um, or Google for that matter. Um, but my rule of thumb is sort of keep it down to like a few megs a day. Um, I did read once that a reviewer uh, posted a four and a half megabyte per day. Uh, limit, but I don't even know if that's that's legitimate. Or e a lot of what you're going to find in the review process too is that reviewers are going to give you um, information that's not even necessarily outlined anywhere, not documented. So it's it's hard to sort of take everything with a grain of salt. Avoid slow load times, and what I mean by this is um, if your app stalls or is on your splash screen for more than about 10 seconds, it's probably not going to be approved. Um, and this is a really a, a, sort of points to a bigger problem in your app anyway, where you may have, maybe you're downloading too many assets when the uh, app is first starting up, or more likely you're just trying to do too much when PhoneGap is initialized. Um, so if you notice that when you're testing, if you're, if you're stuck in that splashing for a long time, you're doing something wrong, plus you're not even going to get approved, right? Uh, okay, so bloated app size. And what I mean by this is the physical size of the final IPA or APK file that you're going to generate. Um, there are actually specific guidelines from Apple on this. They, I think the limit is 50 megabytes right now. They keep bumping it up every year or so, but, um, and usually this isn't a problem for us hybrid mobile app developers, right? We do usually don't have too much going on, but if you do, and I know one time I developed an app that was, uh, it ended up being like 30 or 40 megs total, and I was like, this is ridiculous, it's way too big. Um, and at that time, I think um, Apple had guidelines as far as how many megs could be downloaded over a cellular, a cellular network. So therefore, um, my app wouldn't have even been eligible for somebody who's on a, a 4G network to download. They have to be on Wi-Fi. So um, what I did was uh, I looked at my application. It was pretty clear that I had uh, some crazy huge uh, JPEGs and PNGs. And so what I did was I used these simple tools to do some lossy compression on them and actually cut the size of my app from, I think it was 30 to about 15 megs. So another very simple solution. So here's a weird one, um, version number. And my disclaimer here is this actually may be part of the automated checking that Apple does now, but um, if you try and submit an app that has a uh, version number less than one, so if you, if you had 0.1, you submit that, maybe that's your own internal versioning process, um, Apple is probably going to reject you because it implies a pre-release or a beta version of an app, um, which they explicitly deny, and which I'm gonna I'm get into in a little bit here. Um, so this is a simple one, just keep it safe. Use 1.0, you know, regardless of what you really would like to do. Um, here's a big one, this is, this is arguably the most important tip I would give you today, is that um, do not rely on an always connected device. Uh, if your app crashes or otherwise does not function because it doesn't have a network connection, it's not going to get approved, right? Uh, and the simplest way to test this, is, of course, is to put your device into airplane mode, open up the app, and just hit on every single piece of functionality. I mean, it's a pretty easy way to test. Um, uh, one thing you can do, um, oh, I was going to say, the, another. Uh, this should be like a major consideration that you take into play during the design phase of your application. This is not something that you want to just get into during the testing phase because you're going to run into major problems and just something to keep in the back of your mind. And it's hard. This is a hard thing, too, for, you know, as a lot of us are web developers and we come to, um, to PhoneGap 2, and so we're used to that web, uh, basically always connected um, environment. So it's one of those hurdles we have to overcome. So I love this slide. This is a screenshot of the Windows Phone Store uh, when you do a search for Facebook. Um, Knockoff apps are becoming a bigger and bigger problem for mostly for the users. Um, and of course, it's always okay to improve upon an existing idea. That's what we're all doing every day. Um, 
but you cannot copy an existing app, and you especially, especially cannot copy in a, anything that's in, an, in a built-in app. Um, for example, so another, oh, another topic, or another piece of this is that you don't, do not want to utilize any, um, any existing app keywords in your app description. So say you were developing some kind of weird, I don't know how you'd even do it, in some kind of knockoff Facebook app. Um, you cannot use the term Facebook in your app description. Apple's probably going to deny you for that because, again, it's sort of implying that you're, you're trying to cheat the system and copy, the, copy, the, copy some functionality. So like I said before, um, beta or demo versions are explicitly denied. Um, the problem with this is, it, so maybe you may want to get into a situation where you're trying to tease the user with like a beta or demo version of an app. Um, uh, the problem with this is it implies that your app is not feature complete, uh, which, which Apple does not want. They want an app to be standalone. Along, so, and this just means, you know, release whatever you want, but, you know, just make sure you don't include, you know, the word beta or, any, or anything in there. Um, uh, it's also important to point out that if you have a free or a light version of a, of a larger app, it has to be fully standalone. Um, it has to be a fully functional standalone app. You cannot have missing functionality. You cannot force your users to... Uh, to, to upgrade to or push them to the uh, more f uh, uh, fully functional standalone app. It has to be, st it has to have its own, be in its own silo. This is a really obvious one, I just had to throw it in there. Um, you do not want to have any prizes or sweepstakes or any kind of gambling, of course, in your, in your app. You're never going to get by the reviewers or something like this. It's obvious, but I feel like I had to throw it out there. All right, here's a relatively controversial one. Um, there's a lot of confusion out there regarding the concept of downloading content or scripts um, within your app at runtime, including with me, really. Apple's own guidelines state, um, I need to get this, make sure I get this right, apps that download code in any way or form will be rejected. I mean, that's, to me, that's just insane that you would even say that. Um, I, but as a hybrid mobile app developer, of course, but. Um, it's, it's really vague, because you can interpret that as even being like almost HTML. It's like, you, I can't download anything. Um, so my advice here is really to stick with, um, don't download and execute JavaScript at runtime. Um, and if you think about it really, you could really alter, uh, you could fundamentally alter your application so that it's something else from what the reviewer reviewed. And I think that's probably what Apple's trying to do here. They want to avoid, um, the ability to, you know, completely switch functionality from one app to another. They want to, they want to know the app that they have approved is essentially the same as what the users are going to be using. Uh, minimal user functionality. So the days of the I'm Rich app are over, I think. Um, and if if you guys remember what that was, I think it was a few years ago. But somebody released a, an app called I'm Rich, and it was uh, like ten thousand U.S. dollars or twenty thousand. It was ridiculous, and a few people actually bought it. And all it was was like a button that you could press that says, hey, I'm rich, or something like that. I mean, it was ridiculous, but the person's a genius. Um, and in case any of you are concerned, uh, fart apps are apparently still cool on the iOS App Store, so, uh, so don't worry about minimal user functionality there. But really, you have to make sure that your app does something right. It needs to have, it needs to have some function, some application in our, in our modern world, right? So advertisements, ads get a little bit tricky. Um, Apple does allow you to use um, whatever ads you like. You don't have to use their iAd service, of course. The one big guideline I, was rec I would recommend that you follow is that you do not rotate ads within one page view. So if you navigate to a new page, that ad has to remain static while the user is on that page or that view. Um, otherwise, it seems like you can get away with quite a bit. Um, I've, I don't like using ads in apps, but I've done it before, and Apple doesn't seem to have a problem with it as long as I Stick to that. Um, here, this may be another uh, obvious one, but um, don't make, don't force a user to uh, agree to any user agreements when they first start up the app. They've already done some kind of agreement by, you know, you know, of course, we all tap, tap, tap through those uh, uh, those user agreements on the iOS and Google side of things. But um, Apple does not want you to force users to agree to something else when they when they start up the app. All right, here's a bad one. Um, 
Obey the human interface guidelines. Remember that humong humongous document I told you about before? Well, this is really the Bible of iOS app development. Um, Apple has really specific directions on the sizes and locations of buttons, icons, navigation bars, etc. cetera. Um, if you get too far outside of the norm, they will deny you. Um, it's a big problem. I've had this come up before. It's, it's really frustrating because you think you know, you really think that the app looks good, but then they're like, oh, you know, your navigation bar is two pixels too large or something ridiculous like that. And um, another uh, thing to consider is that you cannot use any Apple trademarked images or icons in your application. Um, you know, you may think it's flattering, but Apple certainly does not feel that way. Um, and I need to mention, too, that I... Get an extra slide here. Oh, the... Uh, so the resource, uh, the human inter interface guidelines, obviously something anybody can take a look at. Another thing that's actually a much better, um, more condensed version is the App Store review guidelines. Unfortunately, that does require an Apple uh, developer account to access, but it's really short. It's like a couple pages long, but it gives you some really good um, guidelines that's, that are really easy to consume. And I need to mention too, um, and full disclaimer, this is my company, um, but. Uh, Kendo UI Mobile is a wonderful mobile JavaScript framework out there. It, it ships with iOS 6, 7, oh, Android, Windows Phone, BlackBerry themes out of the box. So you really don't have to worry as much about violating these app-specific visual guidelines. Um, it also pairs nicely with Icinium as a sort of an end-to-end -end app development platform. Um, and if actually if any of you are curious about Icinium, come see me afterwards. Um, there's a couple of Telerik guys in the audience here too. If you find any of us, um, we have some Icinium codes to free license codes to give out, so. And, and company plug and disclaimer. Um, matching icons, this is kind of a weird one, but um, you wanna make sure that any app, uh, um, any app icons you have, that they, they, the icons all look the same. Um, so the 57 by 57 icon has to match exactly the big 512 by 512, so it may be more tempting to put more detail make your 512 one a little bit cooler looking, but really they all have to match. Maybe obvious, but. Um, okay, if you're taking payments, if you're taking in-app payments, um, whatever you do, do not try and take somebody's money without using um, Apple's, um, what is it called, the uh, in-app purchasing API. If you, if you try and use PayPal or any other payment service, there's just no way that uh, Apple's gonna approve you. I mean, you're, gonna, you're coming between Apple and their money, right? That's just never gonna happen. Um, so uh, there are plugins, however, um, of course. There's Cordova plugins for almost everything these days. Um, the iOS in-app purchase plugin and the Android has its own in-app in billing plugin. Uh, so, sorry, I'm really dirtying it up here. Um, a few years ago, uh, there was some controversy surrounding Apple and the rejection of some slightly off-color or racy apps. Um, really, it seems uh, common sense dictate now, dictates now that you stay pretty conservative in your, in your apps. Um, you don't, I mean, really the words on there describe it the best, no swimsuits, no skin, no innuendo. You don't wanna, you don't wanna push the boundaries. I mean, it's, it's silly, you know, we Americans just can't handle it, you know, so it's, just, just leave it out. Um, here's another one that may, you may be like, oh, this is common sense, but um, accurate app description is, uh, this is really important. Um, you need to make sure that your, uh, the description of your app is relevant to what your app actually does. Apple, ha they definitely do this a lot. They will deny your app just because the description is not perfect. It, it, um, they, they are really keen on people describing their apps fully and making sure you're outlining a lot of the functionality. You have a lot of space to do this, so feel free to be verbose when you're writing these descriptions. Along with that, uh, never include a price in your description. Um, for one, it's bad form. Uh, also, uh, if you think about it, your users are coming from many different countries with many different currencies, so you don't want to include your sale price in there. Another sure way to get rejected. Here's a tricky one, too. Um, Apple explicitly says that you cannot require user registration to use an app, and that, I mean, when I heard that, I'm like, oh, this is insane. How many times have I started up an app and I've had to, you know, sign up to use it? 
Um, what it appears to be, and what I think Apple's true intent here, is that you cannot force a user to provide you with personally identifiable contact information to sign up for an app, or to sign up to use an app. Um, and what I mean by that, you know, email, phone number, that kind of thing. So if you just let them log in with a, you know, user-generated username and password, that seems to be fine. Uh, what's also nice, too, is if you provide an interface like a demo account or something like that. Um, certainly the same thing, you know, same thing goes with websites, too. We, I think we've learned now that if you, if you lock out users and force them to sign up or sign in um, before purchasing anything or before signing up, people tend to back out of that anyway. But... Um, so my last tip here, and maybe, maybe this is most important of all, is really an app is an app because it cannot be a mobile website, right? And, and really, as PhoneGap developers, we need to keep this in mind. Um, we're all using tools and frameworks that were built for the web, and you know, we're kind of repurposing them now for mobile apps. Um, this is a really thin line. I, I, I really agree this, is, this can be very difficult. But for me, I've always said, you know, if it looks and feels like a website, it's probably not going to be approved. In fact, I have seen this myself with the first piece of crap app I tried to get approved. Apple said right away, um, and this I was using, not to knock on jQuery Mobile, because I think jQuery Mobile is great, um, uh, but I, when I used like one of the alpha versions of jQuery Mobile and I tried to submit an app, they're like, no, this, this is a website. You cannot submit this. You need to rework this and make it look more like an app, look and feel more like an app. So just an important thing to keep in mind. All right, now that I've brought you all down and you're just completely miserable and thinking everything's going to get denied, um, the good news is that the vast majority of apps that you submit are going to be approved. I think uh, what I read was something around 96% of apps actually do get approved eventually, and this is on the iOS side. Um, so just go through, you know, it may be a painful process, but go through it. Um, more often than not, when you get that first rejection, it's, it's a simple fix. It's maybe just on one of your pages, one of your views that you need to tweak something. So um, the sky is not always falling. Um, and one thing I want to leave you with is this counter. Uh, recently, a group of developers decided to test Apple to see how long their app was actually in use during the review process. They used some simple analytics tools. Um, they found that on average, the app itself was used for a little more than one minute, um, which I was pretty shocked by this. Uh, it's a pretty important reminder, though, that there are real people behind these reviews who are clearly pressured into reviewing a lot of apps. Uh, maybe they're overworked. Uh, it's just important to remember that they're going to make mistakes as often as we do. Um, in fact, one time I submitted an app and the rejection was uh, that I was saving data inappropriately, like back to my you know, local storage slide. Um, I was utilizing local storage, so I kind of freaked out. And I was like, this is not, you know, I, as far as I know, this is completely legitimate. And so what I did was I calmly explained, um, as far as I am aware, blah, 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 this should work. If not, talk to Brian LaRoe. Um, but uh, no, they, they actually, um, I, within a day, I had an approved app, so without any comment, so I think... Sometimes if you're nice, if you're patient, you know, just like in the real world, people will usually return that favor to you. So um, that's it for me, though. Thank you so much.